Chapter Five of Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fifth Reel, Hollywood, July twelfth, nineteen fifteen. Dear Clara Bell, of course I have told you the way some of these stars is acting over the success I have been making in the silent drama. How they would all go up stage and refuse to go on as long as I was in sight. Well, I was a permanent member of the Lasky All Star Stock Company for a few minutes and could have soon been running Blanche Sweet a close second, when the blow-off came. It was this way. Me and Geraldine Farrar, and Mr. DeMille and all of us, went down to take the bullfight scenes in Carmen, which, by the way, hasn't got a darn thing to do with cars, but tells all about a lot of wops, at the stadium. Yes, that's the right spelling. Before twenty thousand of the elite of Los Angeles, when the bull saw me and refused to go on. Wouldn't that bog your film? Even the dumb animal knew he was running up against an artist. When all this happened, I hadn't started to act at all. I was just getting my face in shape to register excitement and surprise when the bull crabbed the act. It was a shame, too, Clarabelle. Although I was only one of the twenty thousand, I knew my work was so distinctive that I would stand out above all the others. I had it all doped out to do a feint and a comedy fall into the bull ring and hand the bull a hunk of hay in a jaunty manner that would have got me a job for life. Some jealous cat must have told the bull for when he came into the ring, he was as mad as all get out. Clarabelle, I never did see a bull so mad. I wouldn't go near him. He actually acted rough and not like a refined animal at all. I had a hunch that I would be blamed for it, so I snuck out of the grandstand and rambled for home. Believe me, Clarabelle, you could have played checkers on my mantilla all the way to Hollywood. Mr. DeMille is a lovely man and has a nice disposition, but they say when he gets mad, he would just as soon as not go right down into the ring and run the bull ragged. Since that time, I have not been back. Tomorrow I am going down and see David Work Griffith, the director. I have seen them gish girls, and they don't do a lot of things before the camera, that I would, and I am going to tell Mr. Griffith about it. I know if he had ever have seen my diploma, he would have given me the part of the clam and the clamsman just as well as not. Well, there is a fire sale of beef stew down at one of the cafeterias, and I think I will attend. All for now. Love, Molly. Hollywood, July 20. Dear Clarabelle, Them that like this battle stuff can have it, but not for me, never no more. I just assaulted the Alamo for David Griffith, and I am off conflicts for life. If I was those soldiers in the trenches, I would just drop the whole thing and go home. Bullfights is bad enough, but battle stuff has it looking like sinful idleness. Those mutual reliance, correct spelling, studios is a terrible place. Bernie Seedman told me that people had been lost in there for days at a time, and they kept dogs there to go out and hunt missing persons. It's all right to start into, but once when you get inside, unless you carry a map, you are gone. I'm offered an engagement for one day as a Spanish senorita for Mr. Chris Cabani, who is putting on the Alamo. The man said go right back on the stage, but believe me, Clarabelle, before I found the stage it was time to quit for lunch. You are as apt to end up in a property room as to find the stage you want. They say the thing was built by a Chinaman who went bug-house designing puzzles. While I was rambling around trying to find Cabani and his Alamo, I runs right into Mr. Griffith. There he was, sitting on the stage with his company around him, telling them about the script. Not that I wanted to get May Marsh's job or anything like that, but I horned right in and sat down with the rest of them. Mr. Griffith called me over, and right there is where the argument started. He pushed back my tresses to take a peek at my forehead, and as he turned away he said something. I claim he said beautiful while there are others who insist he said bovine. I don't know what the last word means, but from the actions of some of the cats present, I feel that there is a veiled knock in it. Then Mr. Griffith told me I had better run along, and not keep Mr. Cabani waiting, so I stepped right along. But I know I made an impression, for as I left he said, And they kill people like Lucretia Bargia. I don't know who the lady is, but anyway her name is not in Who is Which in Filmland. Mr. Cabani is a nice little man with a Charlie Chaplin mustache. Sam DeGrasse is in the picture. He is a nice man, but he has a mean part. Clarabelle, I could never fall in love with a villain. Juanita Hansen is the leading woman. She seemed to be all right, but never acted enough, but would do only what the director told her. How can those poor nuts know what fire burns in a woman's bosom? We were working in interior sets all day with a lot of shooting and things, and were just getting ready to go home when Mr. Cabani said be back at eight o'clock for some night stuff. What do you think of taking motion pictures at night? This was the attack in the Alamo over in a vacant lot near the studio. I was one of the brave defenders inside the building, 
and the Mexicans were attacking us from the outside. Everybody was shooting away. When I get an idea, that would have helped the scene wonderfully. So all I did was to open one of the big doors and walk over to where Mr. Cabani was directing by the camera and asked him in a quiet ladylike voice if I couldn't save a child or something. With a prop kid, I could have done a dandy close-up sliding down a rope or something. He didn't take it in the helpful spirit I meant at all. You know, dear, some people hate to have suggestions made them. He is one of them. I came darn near going over to Tom Wilson and asking him to come back long enough to hand the fresh director a haymaker. Needless to say, I resigned at once. I would not lend my art to any guy who dished up the language he did. No one in Hollywood slept while he was doing the picture, and I hope he gets pinched for disturbing the piece. When I was over taking my makeup off, one of the extra girls had the nerve to bawl me out for cutting in on the scene. You ought to know better than spoil a couple of miles of perfectly good film by horning in that way, she says. The idea, she said, walking right across the foreground when that big battle was going on. You are darn lucky not to have been beamed by a wad from one of those guns. If I had have been the director, I would have stuck you head first into one of the cannon and to let it rip. If your mind was under diffusers, she says to me. There would be enough room in it to stage all the scenes of the clamsmen at once. I wish you could have saw the look I gave her, Clarabelle. All I said was, How your artistic temperament ever got you away from the wash tub is more than I can imagine. With that, I sauntered out. When it comes to a call down, Clarabelle, I am there. None of them have got anything on me. I'll bet if I had have shown her my diploma, she would have felt even worse. These here stars can't make me forsake my art. I got a nice room and a landlady who is not in too much of a hurry, and I am eating regularly. I'll make these directors appreciate my talents if I have to start a company of my own. I got to write to the ten-dollar Mary Pickford for a new diploma. This one is nearly wore out. Write soon. Love, Molly. P.S. One thing I like about the movies is that it keeps you out in the open air. So far, that is about the only place I have been. End of chapter 5